In November 2006, a UFO encounter took place over Chicago's O'Hare Airport that involved multiple trained observers, including pilots, flight controllers, and airport personnel. The sighting is one of many to involve aviation workers, and adds to the body of evidence proving that pilots and other trained observers see UFOs more often than public confessions would tend to indicate. The case of the O'Hare UFO also reveals the extent to which airlines, airports, and regulatory authorities still intervene to stop these sightings from reaching the general population. On the afternoon of November 7, 2006, Chicago was overcast, with a low cloud ceiling at about 1,900 feet, or 580 meters. Around 4 p.m., Staff at the O'Hare International Airport were handling a high volume of traffic when many noticed a stationary gray object hovering directly above an airport gate. The first evidence for the UFO's appearance comes from Craig Burzik, inbound ground controller for the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA. At 3.58 p.m., Burzik was recorded advising the pilot of Gateway Airlines Flight 5668 to use caution as someone had reported a UFO or flying disc above sea concourse. All right, somebody reported a UFO or a flying disc above Charlie Concourse, seriously. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so uh, nobody, can, keep my eyes open. nobody can see it, but use caution. All right. Um, the next witness to see the object and come forward about it was an anonymous former radio news anchor and reporter known as J.H., who happened to have experience with many types of aircraft. J.H. was on her way to the airport with a friend when she first noticed the object in the sky sometime after 4 o'clock at the intersection of Mannheim Boulevard and Irving Park Road. Observed from the side, the UFO was evenly elliptical, thicker than a frisbee. Other people on the road had seen it too, and were trying to take pictures. J.H. and her friend watched from this position for less than a minute before they parked at the International Terminal. For roughly 10 minutes after, they stood and watched the UFO at an estimated distance of a quarter mile, or 0.4 kilometers. J.H. guessed that at least 15 witnesses across the lot were already looking at it, with several taking pictures. She estimated that the UFO was hovering 300 to 400 feet below the cloud ceiling. From this angle, the object appeared to be taller in the middle, with narrower rounded edges. Later calculations estimated that the object was between 18 and 88 feet wide, or about 5.5 to 27 meters. It was completely featureless, with no lights and no apparent engines or exhaust with a lightly reflective surface like ceramic or buffed metal. Reflecting the tarmac below, its bottom appeared to be dark gray, while the top seemed to almost absorb the whitish color of the clouds. J.H. also noted some fuzzy distortion in the air around it, which she thought may have been due to the object rotating rapidly, though she wasn't sure of this. A United ramp mechanic, known only as Mr. XX, was on the tarmac directing a United plane back at gate C-17, when he claimed that he felt inexplicably compelled to look straight up. He was startled when he spotted a round, rotating metallic object silently hovering an estimated 500 to 1,000 feet above him. The mechanic radioed the operations center, then notified the cockpit crew in the Boeing 737-500 he was directing. He estimated that his sighting lasted only around two minutes, and that at least ten others had also spotted the UFO. The mechanic's notice prompted the two 737 pilots parked at gate C-17 to open their side windows for a better look. The first officer, who had over 13,000 flying hours at the time of his sighting, later described it as being perfectly round and silent, dirty aluminum in color, and very stable. The two reportedly watched the object for five minutes. Another two witnesses were aviation mechanics for United, one of whom shared his story anonymously. Joe, as he is known, was in the cockpit of an empty Boeing 777 with his co-worker close to four o'clock when they heard a pilot on the radio mentioning a disc-shaped object over gate C-17. While taxiing the plane past C-terminal, 
The mechanics observed a dark gray ovular object hovering 100 to 200 feet below the cloud layer, which they watched for 30 to 60 seconds. Joe later stated that what he saw definitely was not an aircraft, although it was hazy on its bottom and both ends, but clearer on top. Two unique details of Joe's report are his claims that the object left a trail and that he saw aircraft in the vicinity or aircraft chasing the object. The last verified sighting comes from a United manager who was working in a station operations center around 4.30 p.m. when he heard about the UFO by radio and ran outside his office for a look. The manager described it as a dark metal elliptical object hovering in place over C-17 at roughly a thousand feet. He watched it hover there for about a minute. The UFO remained in place for a total of at least 13 to 14 minutes, according to J.H., who had the longest observation. The UFO then shot upwards at great speed, creating a circular hole in the cloud layer as it disappeared from sight. While most witnesses underneath the object reported a straight upward departure, the manager and J.H., who each stood farther away, noted a lateral movement eastward covering between 200 and 400 feet before hitting the clouds. J.H. also reported that there was no noticeable acceleration of the object, and no sonic boom either. No more than 14 minutes later, the wind had closed the hole in the clouds. Witness reports differ as to when the UFO departed, with estimates ranging from 4.18 to 4.34 p.m. The United Manager and the Ramp Worker both said the object took off after 4.30, but communications from the mechanics taxiing the plane confirmed that the UFO was visible between 3.57 and 4.18 p.m., with the UFO gone when they checked back around 4.20. Considering the discrepancies in times, it's possible that the UFO disappeared after it was first reported ahead of 3.58, then later returned, possibly twice. After the UFO's departure, the airline manager immediately called the United Operations Center to confirm the sighting, then went out to speak with other witnesses. He also noted that the next aircraft into gate C-17 experienced electrical problems. The FAA reported no radar returns corresponding with the sightings, although it's worth noting that their radar systems aren't designed for stationary objects, or those traveling at high speeds. Some of the witnesses later claimed that United Airlines officials had interviewed them after the incident and had them write reports and draw sketches of the UFO. They also advised employees not to speak about their sightings. However, at least one witness in a CNN TV interview said that his airline's management never pressured him to stay quiet. The director of the National UFO Reporting Center, or NUFORC, Peter Davenport, started receiving witness reports on the date of the incident, and later published the full witness reports on the reporting center's website. Reports submitted to New Fork reveal more sightings before and after 4 p.m. At 12.15 p.m., nearly four hours before the main sighting, two witnesses in Wooddale, Illinois, just west of O'Hare, saw several circular white objects hovering over the airport. The UFOs hovered silently in place for 15 minutes, and once, two of them bounced off of each other before they all flew away. The testimony also states that one or more UFOs emitted other objects, and noted other aircraft in the vicinity. Another possible witness is an anonymous person who submitted their testimony in January 2007 to AboveTopSecret.com under the pseudonym Ramp Agent X. This witness claims to have been one of three baggage handlers who saw the UFO while ferrying luggage near Concourse C. The witness described it as a shiny gray fat disc at over a thousand feet altitude. Uniquely, he or she claimed it shifted a bit from side to side. Ramp Agent X pointed the object out to the cockpit crew in the nearby plane and said the pilot clearly radioed in after seeing it. 
Another sighting took place near 5 p.m. in Aurora, Illinois, roughly 26 miles, or 42 kilometers southwest of O'Hare. A family on the back porch of their house saw a silent, round, very shiny silver object that hovered level with the surrounding clouds. The sighting only lasted 20 to 30 seconds, but the father estimated its altitude around 1,000 feet and presumed that it was round in shape. The first media coverage of the O'Hare incident was eight days after the fact, on November 15th, when Davenport was interviewed on Coast to Coast Radio by George Nury. Nearly a month later, Davenport and a witness were interviewed on the Jeff Rents radio program, and the sightings made the Chicago Sun newspaper on Christmas Day. The day after his appearance on the Jeff Rents show, Davenport contacted the Chicago Tribune. The Tribune's transportation reporter, John Hilkovich, spoke with Davenport and interviewed six of the witnesses. On December 29th, Hilkovich was interviewed on Chicagoland Television, or CLTV, and three days later on NPR. But it was his January 1st article for the Tribune that brought the story to international attention. It became the most read article ever on the Tribune's website, quickly gaining over one million visits around the world. The same day that the article was published, Hilkovich and the host of CLTV News were heard excitedly discussing the case before going live. Thanks, how are you? <laughs> Busy with this UFO oh stuff. Oh my god. Did you see it hit the Fox crawl uh, Monday night? Did it? It's just yes. been everywhere. I mean, I've been on CNN, uh, my, do my fourth appearance today. Really? Uh, every MSNBC, every network. Oh my goodness. Uh, United is now acknowledging that they were approached by employees. Mm -hmm. So they've done that okay. flip flop. And mm -hmm. Are they still going by weather phenomenon? Yeah, they're, they're, they haven't changed their story. Mm -hmm. And it's, I've just they heard, are, heard yeah. from other people, you know, since then that, you know, that, that's, that explanation just doesn't wash. So there really is this universal feeling that the government knows a lot more than it's willing to tell. Oh man, okay. In the following weeks, many more outlets published coverage of the events, including the CNN and MSNBC websites. On January 6th, Joe the Mechanic was interviewed in shadow for CNN television, the first witness to appear on TV. Hilkovich stated in an interview that he was impressed by the case and described all the witnesses he had spoken to as aviation professionals and credible observers. Hilkovich reinforced the point that the witnesses didn't claim that the object was a spaceship from another planet. They stressed that the object was unidentified and presented a safety hazard, having violated restricted airspace. The witnesses who later spoke to the media all said that they were certain the object was not an airplane, helicopter, blimp, weather balloon, light or weather phenomenon, or any known human construction. Even though witnesses were adamant in their accounts, authorities at the airline, airport, and even the regulatory agencies played down the incident to the point of lying about the evidence. Officials at both United and the FAA initially told Hilkovich that they had no information on the sighting, despite the fact that several staff members reported it to the airline. United spokeswoman Megan McCarthy stated officials also had no record including nothing in the duty manager's log. United and the FAA had to admit to knowledge of the incident after Hilkovich and NARCAP, or the National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous Phenomena, filed Freedom of Information Act requests. A review of the air traffic communications they obtained uncovered four recordings in which controllers and pilots discussed the UFO. When questioned by CNN reporters, a spokesperson for United Airlines said that the event was not something United would investigate, and directed further inquiry to the FAA. The Transportation Security Administration, or the TSA, and Chicago Department of Aviation did the same thing. However, the FAA spokesperson, Elizabeth Isham Corey, claimed that her agency did not have the power to investigate Years later, Hilkovich characterized the actions of United and the FAA as a cover-up. He even claimed that university researchers contacted him with similar stories of being stonewalled by the government. Corey claimed that none of their controllers saw the object, 
and a preliminary check of radar found nothing out of the ordinary. She concluded that the event was caused by a weather phenomenon and indicated that the FAA wouldn't be investigating further. She also suggested that the supposed UFO was merely the reflection of the airport's lights off the low cloud cover, despite the event concluding past 4.30 p.m., several minutes before sunset. Witness J.H. also definitively confirmed that it was still light out, and no airport lights were on. Hilkovich further revealed that the weather experts and astronomers he spoke to said the light reflection explanation was bunk. After this hypothesis met with resistance, the FAA shifted the focus to the hole left in the clouds. Years later, FAA spokesperson Tony Molinaro claimed that there was an absence of any kind of factual evidence on the event. Molinaro pointed to the natural phenomenon of fall streaks, often called hole punch clouds, suggesting witnesses must have seen the round hole and imagined the round object that made it. For her 2010 book, UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record, investigative journalist Leslie Kane included a chapter on the O'Hare case. Kane spoke to weather experts and found that the U.S. National Weather Service reported a temperature of 53 degrees Fahrenheit at 1900 feet that day, which is well above freezing and not cold enough to produce a fall streak. Furthermore, Kane points out that fall streaks occur when ice crystals from a higher cloud deck fall down onto a lower one. This ran counter to the FAA spokesperson's explanation, which held that vapor somehow ascended through the clouds, defying gravity. The night of the incident, Davenport contacted Dr. Richard F. Haynes, a former NASA research scientist and ufologist with decades of experience in aviation. Haynes had previously helped form NARCAP in 1999, providing a way for pilots and air traffic controllers to make confidential UFO reports. Haynes led an investigation of the incident, assisted by meteorologist William Puckett, aerospace engineer Lawrence Lemke, Canadian pilot and aviation professional Donald Ledger, and five other specialists. The team confirmed that no weather balloons were launched in the vicinity of O'Hare on the date of the incident. They also calculated that the energy it would take to evaporate the surrounding clouds so quickly is around 100 megawatts, equivalent to the power consumed by a Boeing 747 cruising for over seven hours. By comparison, Airborne objects like aircraft, rockets, and artillery rounds do not cut holes in the clouds as they pass through. The team also noted several other cases as far back as 1947 where UFOs cut holes through clouds. On March 9th, Haynes' team produced a report on his investigation totaling over 150 pages. Their report concluded that an apparently solid object was present and that it posed potential safety risks. They also verified the UFO's location as being very likely outside the viewing range of the main tower and the United Ramp Control Towers. Given the failure of O'Hare's radar to detect the UFO, the authors expressed their hope that the report would help build the case for a government investigation and underscore the need to monitor a wider range of electromagnetic phenomena in our skies. While several witnesses insisted that people were taking photos during the incident, Many of the photos presented to the public have been proven fake. No photograph of the O'Hare UFO has ever been confirmed as genuine through rigorous analysis. The O'Hare case was the focus of a 2009 episode of UFO Hunters. The hosts interviewed Hilkovich, as well as NARCAP's executive director, Ted Rowe, and William Puckett, who had both contributed to the NARCAP report. The episode also included the first TV interview with controller Craig Burzik, who confirmed that he and his staff in the tower didn't see the UFO, despite the fact that their sightline would have allowed them to see it. The case was also reviewed in the 2011 documentary Secret Access, UFOs on the Record, which featured both Kane and Haynes. Better than most UFO sightings, the incident at O'Hare showcases the difficulties that witnesses that work in aviation face in communicating their experiences to the public and to independent investigators. 
the FAA has long tried to shirk the UFO question and to dodge responsibility for investigating sightings. Their policy states that members of the public that witness UFOs should contact UFO reporting groups or local law enforcement. What's more, pilots who report their sightings, and especially those that speak to the media, can face repercussions from their superiors. For example, the pilot of Japan Airlines Flight 1628 was grounded shortly after reporting his UFO sighting over Alaska in 1986, and had to spend several years at a desk job before being reinstated as a pilot. Not all airlines are similarly secretive, however. For example, in June of 2007, Orgney Airlines Captain Ray Boyer was flying near Alderney Island south of England when he, his passengers, and another pilot in a nearby plane spotted two large brilliant white cigar-shaped UFOs during the flight. Boyer disclosed that his airline actively encouraged him to go public after being asked about the sighting from the press. The incident at O'Hare Airport is a recent reminder that mass UFO sightings still occur, and that in America at least, witnesses and investigators still get stonewalled by all authorities in their search for explanations. There are many cases on record from around the world to prove that pilots and other airline workers do see UFOs and report them through all the proper channels. But there is reason to believe that there would be many more cases known to the public if airlines and regulatory agencies were more transparent with the evidence. Want to see more from Think Anomalous? Remember to click the bell so that you get notified when we make new videos, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Think Anomalous is created by Jason Charbonneau. Research by Clark Murphy. Music by Josh Chamberlain.